Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, excited to hear um, the, the, the talks today and see um, I'll share with you what, what we worked on. So um, I'm an oncologist and a developmental biologist, and so I study um, cancer biology. And so I sort of became just in a nutshell intrigued by this idea of caloric restriction, which was introduced earlier today. And as was pointed out, it's been studied across many organisms. And um, I found this interesting review where they referred back to a, uh, this uh, Italian um, uh, nobleman who at the age of 35 decided to start cutting down calories and lived to be 103 and became like a proponent of sort of intermittent fasting. And so um, clearly this, this idea seems like it's been around for a long time, but it doesn't seem like we fully understand what, what's going on there. Um, and as we used to talk about, inter fasting at least seems to be associated with improved metabolic parameters and number of studies with less cancer and um, just in a very broad sense. Um, but how does all this work? And so I also became really intrigued with, um, I was interested in studying transcription and epigenetic changes. Um, and from this recent review, I'm talking about just one of the last big up is this notion of onto metabolites, where in some cancers, the cancer cell produces a metabolite that doesn't exist normally and can actually interfere with DNA methylation and lead to altered gene expression and altered um, um, differentiation. And so just the idea that one can draw a line from this metabolic pathway disruption down to alterations in gene expression, in my mind, was sort of where I'd love to be someday, in maybe 20 years from now. Um, and so this is sort of a first foray into that. Um, so what I'm interested in is understanding the emergence of cancer. And so the way I think of this is you have a normal tissue, and those that, that normal tissue undergoes some change. Um, usually an oncogene gets activated, you lose a tumor suppressor, and those cells are now prone to forming cancer. Um, often called, one when they call this a cancerized field of cells, but we don't really understand is why all these cells that are at risk to form cancer, why does only one cell, we think, um, start to form cancer and then expand? And so the model that I study that in is melanoma, where one has a BRAF mutation. I have many moles, I have many BRAF mutations, but Thankfully, only very rarely does that need us undergo additional changes to form melanoma. And so um, this was sort of two things that were interesting to me is that maybe this is modifiable. I don't know that I can keep these BRAF mutations forming, but maybe I can prevent those additional changes from occurring to go on to actually form melanoma. In our zebrafish, um, we have a model developed by Elizabeth Patton um, in Lenzon's lab, um, in which the human BRAF B600E oncogene is expressed in all the melanocytes. So you have this fish with tens of thousands, let's say 10,000 or so melanocytes, and those fish only go on to get roughly one to three melanomas, and it takes months. So there are other things that must be happening in intervening time that leads to um, melanoma forming, and I wanted to try to understand that. And so this fish really is, the whole fish is our, our field at risk. Uh, this is what the, the model looks like. So here's a fish with a rather large tumor um, um, on its back here. And these are identifiable pretty readily by the, the, raised, the raised appearance. Um, they're responsive to BRAF inhibitor therapy. So if you know about anything about human melanoma treatments, BRAF inhibitors are a huge part of that. Our fish are also responsive to these. Um, and then they look, they look like human melanomas histologically um, and at the gene expression level. So, um, Briefly, I'll just give you a quick um, back, a background of one of the tools that we have available, and then at the end, sort of how I moved one of our recent forays into how um, nutrition diet might might figure in. So, neural crest um, is a um, embryonic uh, lineage that forms a number of different cell types, including importantly melanocytes. Here, so melanocytes are the pigment cells that form on our bodies, and if they are um, growing appropriately, form melanoma. Um, and there's a gene in the fish called Crestin. Here's our zebrafish embryo, Crestin in purple, marking the neural crest. Um, one of the postdocs in one's lab, Rich White, good friend, discovered that in a normal adult, Crestin turns off. But when the fish forms melanoma, Crestin turns back on again. And so this suggested to us that Crestin might be a good um, marker of tumor formation. And so um, I developed a, a Crestin EGFP reporter line that reproduce the expression pattern of Crestin in the embryo. And then importantly, in the adult fish, here's a fish swimming around with a tumor on its back there. And um, when we put on the GFP filter, you can see that tumor lighting up. And it's very bright, 
very easy to see. This is filmed with an iPhone 5. Um, and so um, it's, uh, it's pretty robust and was a very happy day in my postdoc career when I saw that fish. Um, and so, you know, we, what this allows us to do then is track t tumor formation. You know, this is something one might be able to see um, grossly just holding the fish up, but, you know, it's preceded five or more weeks by this early patch of cells that was going to form a tumor. So now we can look at the events earlier on. In fact, um, um, it comes out a little bit bright here, but we, I'm able to spot even a single cell that can go on to form melanoma. And so it allows us to see the earliest events we think in tumor formation. Um, and so this, the idea then is that one of the early you know, barriers to tumor formation is acquiring your oncogene activation, your tumor suppressor loss. And then I think that one of the other steps is this reemergence of neural crust progenitor identity. So it involves whether it be dedifferentiation, reprogramming, I know these are very loaded terms, so we don't really know, but we think probably some sort of dedifferentiation. Um, and just as a quick uh, nutshell of what we were, were able to see is that when we look at gene expression and epigenetic landscape near important drivers of melanoma, such as SOX10, you see these regions called super enhancers. So these are highly um, active um, regions on the chromatin that sort of incorporate many cell type specific and oncogene specific transcription factors. We think this is really the regulatory center that's driving this process. And so we've been focusing in and understanding what, what signaling pathways are impinging on this, this regulatory element. Um, and just uh, this has actually been shown as well in, the mouse, in a mouse model more recently where the fully pigmented melanocyte seems to dedifferentiate and go on and form the melanoma. So it was nice. In the fish world, I think we're always trying to say that it's relevant to human cancer. So we've seen in the human, or excuse me, in the mouse model as well. So that was a nice uh, uh, overlap there. So really wanting to look at this um, emergence of, of melanoma as an epigenetic phenomenon. Um, what are the sort of upstream events? And so something we're working on now is to look more deeply at the changes in the melanocytes um, from the melanocytes to the melanoma. And sorry, this got overlapped here, but we're now making, you know, red melanocytes, green tumors, and we're able to look at each step along the way as one goes from a normal BRF mutated melanocyte to a melanoma and really look at the changes in gene expression and um, epigenetic landscape more thoroughly. So moving back then, what sort of upstream events are going on? Are there, are there environmental perturbations to this, this uh, transition from precancer to cancer? And so uh, when I moved from my postdoc at uh, in Lens Lab with Chris Lawrence's our superfish uh, facility uh, uh, administrator, and then we uh, at WashU, I just sort of wanted to see how are things going to behave in this new system. And so we have the Tritoni feeders at, at WashU, and very um, simply just changed the feeding labels on our adult fish from four times, two times, one time a day to sort of establish what we're going to be using parameters of tumor onset in the lab. Um, and so. Um, we started out with this feeding protocol, which is a pretty standard thing where the fish are in E3 for six days, they go on rotor first for a couple of weeks, and then um, I'll expound on this a little bit, then a sort of increasing amounts of uh, Gemma plus rotor fur, and then ultimately just Gemma feed at about 42 days onward. And then um, as, as um, shown here, as they get a little bit older every week, we're adding more and more feedings into where by six to seven weeks, they're getting fed about 12 times a day. Um, and then the, 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 I just adjusted the number of times a day. So in principle, it's the same amount of feed, just different numbers of times a day, mostly just logistical because it was easy to change the QR labels um, and see what would happen. Um, and essentially what we saw um, was very reproducibly that when you feed the fish four times a day versus two versus one, you have a large change in the median onset. Um, here it's about 40 a uh, 42 day difference between four times versus two times a day. Um, a couple things we did was when they were, we had the embryos, we, as I say, grew them all together, but we mixed them all up before distributing them to the different tanks. I was worried about sometimes have sort of a jackpot effect where one group of larvae got, you know, more died off or they didn't grow as well. And then also we replaced fish when we saw a tumor with uh, Casper fish so that we kept the numbers the same. Maybe this isn't perfect, but felt like it was better than just we typically would just remove a fish when you see a tumor. And so you, you kind of accelerate the process because you have less and less fish as they get more tumors. So the same number of fish throughout the experiment as well. Um, and then this was a cohort 
um, that was grow, the born in the city meet one, and then we did it on several different cohorts. And um, the meeting here are you know within a week or two of each other, um, and this sort of was true across three different cohorts of fish, all grown over the course of about two months. So it felt like the you know the, this was reassuring to us that this was a real um, uh, phenomenon and that it was reproducible in our in our facility. Um, then more more perhaps more um, I'm sorry. Then we when I set out it now looking back, I, we should have done more measurements and weights and things like that. But we sort of did at least a snapshot that um, when we measured a uh, snout to tail length of these fish at um, 155 days and 211 days, clearly random dates um, in their lifespan, that there was a pretty consistent and stable difference in the four versus the two times a day, one time a day feeding. The fish that were fed more were bigger. Those that were fed less were smaller. And that seemed to be consistent across the board um, for those groups. And so now with this tool that we have to not only look at you know tumor um, progression, I was interested to see can we see what's going on earlier in the process and is this affecting tumor initiation? Um, so this is a little bit trickier, but what I've seen now um, preliminarily is that when we we increase feeding, we also see increased appearance, or I should say earlier appearance of these crests and these melanoma positive, GIP positive tumor patches. Um, and we can see this even earlier in the process. So um, if, you know, the, the seeing a raised tumor means you've got millions of tumor cells, but now we're just looking for the appearance of even a single GFP positive cell. And we can already see that earlier on in the process. And this got me really excited because maybe now we're getting some initial glimpse into some of the metabolic rewiring that could be going on during this epigenetic switch from melanocyte uh, to melanoma. And this is just one example cohort, but I've seen this over multiple cohorts. And um, we can even make the, I can even see that the effect is more pronounced when one adjusts the, the amount of feeding that's going on during the juvenile stages. Um, I didn't put that data up here because it's still preliminary, preliminary excuse me, but um, you know, I think that there's been mentioned that what, what sort of feeding do we need to do at different steps of life cycle. Um, clearly, my, my sense is that um, some of this is being sort of imprinted in, uh, that's a specific term, some of this is being uh, determined even during the juvenile phase of, of, of growth, and so that may have an important um, impact in, in, in what one sees. Um, and then, so from here with this tool on hand, we have a lot of different directions to go, and I just put out a few that were sort of intri intrigued by is doing intermittent fasting with the fish, um, looking at what act just um, at a basic level, what part of the metabolic machinery is involved. Is, is hyperglycemia enough, let's say, to induce this change? Um, there's been a lot of talk about looking at specific amino acids or other nutrients, and so we've sort of been interested, in, generally speaking, in the types of feeds that would be available where we could cut out a specific amino acid or use genetic approaches to alter a metabolic pathway of interest and then start to tie that in to changes in epigenetic um, parameters that we can study. Um, I put Gary Patty um, a picture here. I know he was intrigued by this and um, wasn't able to be here today, but um, we um, have a shared graduate student who was in Steve Johnson's lab as well and was very interested in this process. And so um, we're looking forward to some collaborations and starting to look at um, true meta no, met metabolomics. Um, he's a chemist, I'm not a chemist. And so, um, you know, we can start to work together to sort of address some of these questions going forward. Um, and then just a few, um, a lot of these have been mentioned, and I, I would say just some of my thoughts on pros and cons, I guess I call this an intensive feeding protocol. Um, and, and we do see this rapid generation time with about six weeks of sexual maturity. But um, I would, would say as well, we definitely have a shorter reproductive cycle. And so for those who are doing genetic screens in our lab, we want to produce gazillions of embryos very quickly. That's awesome. But for my tumor fish, it's less helpful because they, they get sicker sooner. We have to cycle through generations. And then we're trying to inbreed. And so we have to outcross and inbreed. And so that actually is maybe less efficient for us. Um, I think there's definitely great consistency across experiments. but I think this has brought, been brought up about these potential increases in expense and staffing when you have 20 tritonies running in a facility. Um, and, you know, as one who recently went through the job search process, um, 
proposing that may not be feasible at all places. So, um, how you know, what are the costs of entry to becoming a superfish researcher in a new place? I think that that is something that I'm sure will be considered in the uh, recommendations um, going forward. Um, and just a number of folks to thank briefly my my group here at uh, Lens Group, I should say, in Boston, and then my new my group here at uh, in St. Louis. And I wanted a particular thank Vadim who helped with the feeding experiment. He's now a master at spotting melanoma tumors in my graduate student group, in particular John, uh, who's been working on the the metabolism stuff, and uh, Eva who generated a lot of epigenetic data for us. So happy to take questions. On your length curve, yeah, and since all cells are prop, you're not producing hypertrophic, like they're not bigger cells, so you're producing more cell divisions, right, with the higher food. So the fish are proportionally bigger because there are more cells. So can you normalize your curve to number of cells that basically you're seeing it sooner because there are more cells there because they're they're they're, they're cycling more quickly. Yeah, that's a great. But yeah, I think um, we, we I, I've never we haven't counted the number of you know, are there more cells at risk? Are there more melanocytes at risk to develop melanoma? Or as you say, the number of, of cell divisions is that increased? Um, yeah, I haven't done that, but that's a good thought. Um, there's that that literature about um, if you you know count the number of cell divisions for a given organ type, it seems to correlate with your risk of getting cancer and you know, tissues that divide more, you get more cancer in. Um, that kind of a notion for sure. That's a good thought. Chris. So just to, to clarify, the only thing you varied was the frequency of feeding, not the total amount of food going into the tank. It was the you know 60 milligrams per per dump from the, the feeder. And uh, that was uh, we just just did it four times, two times, one time. And the reason also why we picked those is that in theory in our facility, when the fish achieve a size that you want, you're supposed to switch down to two and one. Um, and so I you know, just went with what was on our protocol and what you know, I just started at the one just to you know, do a slower amount from the get go. So you did have a total, your, your amount of food going into each tank did vary. Vary across the day, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just frequency, but yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks.